Hey everyone, um, we're starting the second session now. Uh, I'm gonna go and make an announcement on Gather also, and then we'll actually get started. Hey everybody, I'm uh, making an announcement now that the next uh, session is starting. Um, if you, I've updated the TV link. If you're still on one of the old TV links, then uh, it won't show anything, so you'll have to like, refresh it. So we need to actually like, back it up and then go through it again. But you can also just go to the YouTube channel and you'll see it there also. So uh, uh, see you over the, the screen. All right, announcement has been made. Um, we have here with us uh, Hazel and Sid, who will be giving our two presentations uh, for this session. Um, let me unspotlight myself, uh, unpin myself so that everyone can see. Um, how do I do that? Move pin, okay. Um, uh, Sid, you wanna say hi? Hey, everyone. Very good. And Hazel, will you say hi? Hello. Okay, great. So um, like we did with the first session, um, we're going to have, uh, I'm going to play um, first Hazel's talk, and then we'll switch to Q&A. Um, and you can type your Q&A questions um, in the, uh, the gather chat or in the Google Doc that's uh, on the document link. And then afterwards, uh, after that Q&A, then we'll go immediately into Sid's talk, and then we'll do Q&A also. And then after both talks are over, then we'll go back to the gather space where we'll do impromptu uh, Q&A in the hallway track. Um, Hazel is going first. So they'll be in the upper left-hand corner. That's the A area. And Sid is going second. So he'll be in the upper right-hand corner, the B area. So uh, I'm going to um, get the talk uh, ready, uh, and um, I'll mute and turn off the audio uh, for, bo for both of us, um, for, for all the speakers. So let's do that right now. Hi, I'm Hazel, and today I'm going to be talking about Sawzall, a record library I've created for manipulation of structured tabular data. First, we'll take a look at how Sawzall acts on some standard data sets. In particular, to start off this talk, we'll take a look at the general social survey from the year 2016. This data has various individual level preferences about different people. For example, we know that there is a male in the Northeast that is between the ages of 34 and 49 by looking at the first row. 
let's say we want to get the percent religious preference by census region. So, we want to know, for example, what percentage of people in the Midwest are Catholic, at least in the context of this data. Well, this data doesn't immediately provide that, so we have to do some transformations. First, we start off with our individual level data, and then we want to summarize it down to count by region of religious preferences. So, we take all of the Midwest Catholics and turn them into a single number representing how many there are. Then, we would take those and turn them into our desired percentage by taking them and dividing them by the total. So how will we do this with Sozzle? First off, we load in our data with a threading operator, which effectively acts like compose, and then we group it with respect to big region and religion. This doesn't do anything initially, but it tells Sozzle future operations how to act on this data. Then, we create a new variable count that depends on the variable big region and computes its length. Because we told Sozzle about the grouping earlier, this then sums within each region and within each religion. We can then create a new variable frequency depending on count that takes the e count of each individual religion and divides it by the total in that region. And then create a new variable percent depending on our frequency, that just multiplies it by 100. And we have our percentages. We can then use Graphite, another library for Racket that's designed to integrate with Sozzle and the kind of tabular data that we're working with here, to plot this. So, we take in our data, saved as religion by region, we map the x-axis to religion, the y-axis to percent, and facet on the variable big region, and we use the call renderer to tell Graphite to draw a bar chart. We can now gain some reasonable insight from this data. For example, we now know that, at least in this data set, Protestant respondents in the South greatly outnumbered any others. So what is Sozzle? Sozzle is a racket library for data manipulation that's designed to act like map, filter, and fold, but for structured data, rather than something like a list or a vector. It's designed to be compositional, using the threading operator, which is effectively just compose. It's inspired by the R packages dplyr and tidier, part of the tidyverse, an R software package created by Hadley Wickham for data science. So what is tidy data? The problem is that when you implement something like map, filter, and fold over structured data, structured data can take many shapes, including an incomprehensible Excel spreadsheet. So the idea behind tidy data is that data frames are just a record of vectors, and we work with data by variable so you should be able to get a single variable by just selecting from the record. To accomplish this, we make three assumptions. Every column must represent exactly one variable, every row must represent exactly one observation, and every cell must represent exactly one value. These three assumptions are the language that all of Sozzle's operators speak. Therefore, it's the key thing that we end up abstracting over. Most of Sozzle's wrangling pipelines have four different operators. Create, which adds new variables that depend on existing variables. So for example, we have the new variable total, that is the sum of the adult and juve columns on the left data, producing the column in the right data. This acts similar to map. Slice, which picks columns to retain based on their names. Here, we use the slice pattern containing T to remove any columns that do not satisfy this from the left. Where, which picks rows to retain based on their values. Here, we filter down rows that contain an adult value that, are, that is greater than 3, so anything that doesn't satisfy that is right out. And finally, aggregate, which reduces many values down to a summary, so we can create a new variable as a function of adult that is just this length. But this doesn't seem very useful in, on its own. Like, we're just taking all of our data and turning it into a scalar. And while that may be sometimes what you want, aggregation and creation and all of these other operators are more powerful than that. The idea is that a lot of these data manipulation tasks happen in groups. Referring to our GSS example within the group region. So, we can compose our existing operators with grouping 
to avoid repeating ourselves. Here, we aggregate down the adult column into its sum and the juve column into its sum. But we can work with respect to the group GRP, and then Sozzle only works in the context of these groups. In addition, these groups stack. So if we add another group TRT, Sozzle will then permute on all of the possibilities of these groups. Next, we'll take a look at what happens when you get data that's out in the wild and maybe not as good as our GSS example. In particular, our GSS example was actually pulled straight out of a data science textbook. It's pretty much as good as data can be. But what happens when you have data that's actually pulled from a real source? It's probably not going to be tidy. Here, we'll take a look at the Billboard Top 100 data from the year 2000. So, we can know by looking at the first row that Baby Don't Cry by Tupac ranked 87th in its first week after release. The problem, though, is that this data isn't tidy. We have all of these WK columns, which are actually values of the variable week. So how do we deal with that? Sozzle doesn't know how to speak this language. Well, to fix it, we use Sozzle again. In particular, what we really want to do is take all of our WK columns and turn those names into the values of a variable week. Then take all the values that are in those columns and turn them into values of a variable ranking. So, we use the pivot longer operator to accomplish this. We take all of the things matching the pattern starting with WK, and we turn their names into a variable week and their values into a variable ranking, preserving the order. Then, we drop the WK prefix from the string and turn it into a number to make it easier to deal with while graphing. We now have tidy data, so let's try and do some analysis with it. In particular, let's say we're big fans of Blink-182, and we want to see how they did in the year 2000. We can use the where star operator, which acts like where, but it uses a match pattern, and filter down to all of the ones where the artist is Blink-182. We have all of these hash apps in the ranking, though. What's up with that? Well, that's saying that Blink-182 was 89th in week 1, but they weren't on the charts at all in week 76. We can use the drop NA operator on the ranking variable to get rid of all these hash apps, and the reorder operator on the variable week to sort it in a way that makes sense. Finally, we can use graphite again, mapping the x-axis to the week, the y-axis to the ranking, and making a line plot, lower being better. And we can now know that Blink-182 peaked at week 12 of its release by looking at this graph. So, similarly to wrangling, tidying data has four key operators. Unlike wrangling, though, these are more like families of operators rather than individual runs. In particular, perhaps the most important is the pivot operator, which changes the shape of the data to be longer or wider. As we can see here, we can take the variables a and b using the slice pattern ab and turn their names into the variable site and their values into the variable catch. We call this lengthening the data because it is quite literally adding more rows and making it longer. Similarly, there's a wider operation that goes the opposite direction. Unnest, which spreads out nested structure like lists into multiple variables. Sozzle doesn't know how to deal with lists or vectors or hashes, at least not on its own. So the unnest operator can spread out these into their own variables so we can then deal with them. Here, we have hash tables in the input data, so we can spread it out with the unnest longer operator. Separate, which spreads out strings into multiple variables. For example, if you want to do date processing, you could use this to parse down the date into multiple year, month, day variables, and work with it from there. Finally, reorder, which sorts the data according to some variable or comparator. Here, we take the data on the left and sort it backwards by the adult column. Finally, let's take a look at how Sozzle works under the hood. In particular, most of Sozzle's individual operators are actually macros, and all of them, function or macro, have the signature data frame to data frame 
or some kind of wrapper structure, like a group data frame, to represent grouping. The consistency of all of these operations without any side effects means that these operations compose with the pipeline operator, and we found that this results in a very natural do this then that flow to programs. In addition, Racket is really good at writing down what you want to write and figuring it out later. In particular, aggregate and create and all of these forms have syntax that doesn't really follow Racket's standard model. But we don't care. We can just write down whatever we want and then make macros do the heavy lifting later. Ultimately, I found that this meant that I could express what I wanted to in the most ergonomic way I could, and then work it out later. In addition, Sossel uses a lot of these things called syntax class DSLs. Racket preaches language-oriented programming, but sometimes you want languages within hashlang Racket without having to use a separate one. Syntax classes from syntax parse let you parse embedded DSLs at compile time. So also use these extensively for various operators that actually speak their own domain-specific language, namely the slice operator, which follows the grammar you see here. As you can see, some of these actually have conflicts with racket functions, but we don't care. At compile time, we use the syntax class called slice spec and it takes all of our slice patterns and turns them into a structure that a regular function can take. In particular, we parse everything to everything s and containing to containing s, etc. And it's all defined as a recursive structure. So what's Sozzle already good for? Processing small in-memory data sets, like the ones on this talk, or the ones on the right, which represents New York City flights in 2013, already works pretty well. In addition, basic relational processing like joining data, works very well as well. Basic data science tasks can be completed, including the overwhelming majority of introductory textbooks, like Hadley Wickham's book, are for data science, in conjunction with the math library. In addition, I've been kind of hand-waving around Graphite. Graphite's this whole other library created to work with this for visualization, and there's also a scheme workshop talk about that, if you'd like to know more. With future directions for the project, feature parity with R and the tidyverse is a non-goal. Those projects have had a ton of time to develop, and ultimately, features will be added as people want to use them. In addition, performance still leaves a lot to be desired, which is why processing very large datasets may not be a great fit right now. This also works super well when working with a single data frame, but relational data, like joining, could work better and more fluidly. Finally, Salsa is currently dependent on Alex Harsanyi's data frame library, but ultimately we're not really relying on any of the specifics, and it could be abstracted away from it. This could be a generic interface, possibly even interfacing with real databases or other means of storing tabular data. Salsa is more generally useful than just the examples and anecdotes I've shown in this talk. If you'd like to know more, please check out our GitHub repository and guide a tutorial. Thanks to Kieran Healy's excellent data visualization textbook and Hadley Wickham's R for Data Science textbook for providing a plethora of examples, not only for this talk, but also to benchmark Sawzell and Graphite against. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Hazel. Yeah, hi. <laughs> um, so uh, as before, we can take in questions by adding them directly to the um, Google Doc that's on the docs. Um, that's probably that's the best way for, for me to hear your questions, but it is possible. Uh, to send them other ways, but this is the best way because I don't think I've got these two computers going on. One's a proven one, one's not. So Hazel, let's start off. Can you tell me like why you decided to make this project? I mean, um, I, I feel like you've you you know you you showed why it's cool and what and what it does, but like uh, why why do you personally care about this? Um. So well, uh, initially I cared about it because my advisor told me to care about it. But aside from that, um, 
it's so a lot of like PL papers, et cetera, end up using Racket and end up having to typeset like performance graphs or various other things. And um, the initial motivation was that um, in order to make these performance graphs, we would have to use like a plot library and then you would have to turn this into a format that the plot library understands. And you had like this giant mess of code that you end up having to create in order to make these plots. That's where Graphite came in and we said, okay, we can go look at the actual like realm of data science and see how to make this more ergonomic. And then once Graphite was in a reasonable state, we realized that this is more generally useful than just like making data in the code and then plotting it. It's actually possible to take code from the wild and then work with it there. The problem with data in the wild is that a lot of it is messy and a lot of it doesn't give you the insight that you want, which is why Sozzle exists now. And even beyond that, a lot of people have used this for like actual like data processing, like they get something messy from like some internal tool and then use it to tidy it. So it's even more generally useful than I initially envisioned. So cool. So um, I think that's very interesting because you know you basically had like a really particular itch of a you know PO kind of person. <laughs> I want to make these to performance graphs. And now um, you know, rather than just uh, being a bad programmer and copy and pasting a lot of code and, you know, just sort of one-offing it, you said, okay, well, how can we make uh, something beautiful? And maybe, you know, you're leveraging a lot of what people have done in the, uh, the R data processing world. Mm -hmm. uh, now, those primitives that you talk about, I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a data processing idiot, okay? So if I go read that book, are they going to talk about all the exact same primitives that you are talking about? Or are you adding, you know, some special uh, PL sauce there? Um, so it's pretty much like a lot of the things in dplyr and tidy or dr libraries are called the things that they are because the existing operator names that they would actually want to use were already part of the R programming language. So right. more or less, you can kind of just take like, the R operator names and the R operator syntax, mm -hmm. and then say, okay, what does this actually mean? And then you usually get the sozzle operator. Um, in terms of other things, a lot of times uh, some of the R operators had like really weird semantics to them. So you like if that? you look through the like um, data visualization textbook that I mentioned from Karen Healy, um, there was one particular example where like I believe a variable n was simultaneously bound to like a number and a vector, and the resulting code was extremely confusing. Um, so, like, basically, you can think of the majority of Sussex operators as a slightly more verbose and slightly more direct version of the R operators, where things don't get magically bound in random places. I see. Yeah. I'll, I'll I'll call that more principle. <laughs> Whatever you want to call it. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, so here's a few little questions. Um, I think that uh, some people don't know why you named it Sawzall. Uh, I feel like that this is kind of like an American brand thing. W will you just explain again what a, why it's called Sawzall? Sawzall is another name for a reciprocating saw. A reciprocating saw cuts stuff. This cuts stuff. Yeah, and isn't it isn't it just a, like an American brand a Sawzall? Because it saws everything, it saws all. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, it was actually Sam TH who came up with the name for this. Yeah. I came up with the name for Graphite, uh, but he came up with the name for this. So maybe probe him for more questions on that one. But my my wife loves her saws all. It was a uh, it was one of you know the best uh, best Mother's Day gifts I ever got her. Um, now, uh, is there any hope for doing this in a typed way? And what would that even mean? to do types for something like this. Uh, so for instance, obviously there's like data frame is just a thing, but then, you know, I imagine that there are certain primitives that you use that would break if the data wasn't formatted correctly. Is there hope of doing it so that that is a typed interaction? I have, uh, actually this is a question that I already got, and the answer is, I feel like the definition of what tidy data is, despite the fact that I give it as these invariants, right? Um, ultimately, there's not really a good way for a computer to look at data and say, this is tidy, or this is not tidy, 
aside from like having lists or vectors and hashes in it, then you could maybe automatically expand that. But I don't really think that there is a good way of getting a computer to recognize that. Like, for example, all of the WK columns and like the billboard example, there's no reasonable way without like, I don't know, like random machine learning garbage or something weird um, to tell the computer, like, these are actually values of a variable rather than actually being the variables that you want. So in short, I have no idea. Uh, but <laughs> so I feel like you answered the question, is there a yeah. like type directed or generic way to automatically do some of the things that Sawzall does? And I think that I might be asking a more mundane question, which is, um, I am going to call one of your operators and I accidentally give it a number. Okay, I want this to error. Presumably this is easy, but maybe it's a little bit harder to say that I want to, um, you know, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you an operation that requires, I don't know, like a data frame with three elements and, oh, I accidentally gave you one that only has two elements and I want to catch that error at compile time. Um, are these interesting or hard problems or is it just like boring and you haven't done it? Um, it's, I, so one thing is that if we're talking specifically about like the exact shape of data with regards to the number of columns and rows, that's like one of the few things in my mind that dependent typing is really good for uh, is because that like the prototypical example of like a dependent type is like a length indexed uh, right, like yeah. vector. So that wouldn't be that hard to generalize to matrices. And that's honestly probably like we've, we've done a solid amount of work there. Um, how that applies to Sawzall, I don't know, because again, like... It, it still requires a, like a human to really understand what the invariants you want out of the links are. Um, and moreover, when I talk about the shape of the data, what we really care about is tidiness and that's really difficult to measure. So, so maybe a, kind of your answer is, uh, yeah, you might be able to enforce these things, but what's the point? Because you're just gonna, you're really gonna duplicate all the information that's already in your program anyways. And the whole point of this is that you're kind of doing some sloppy, uh, you know, tidying up in the first place and types, you know, type based programming has this, uh, you know, idea where you're doing a lot of thinking beforehand about what it is. And that doesn't really work with tidiness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I kind of feel like all of tidiness, but not the input to tidiness. Yeah, I kind of feel like the a lot of the point behind this is the, the kind of exploratory data analysis that you might want to do. Like you might want to just like, throw some ideas at your data and figure out what happens and the amount of pre-planning that goes into having to write up a specification and a type would be but i'm not going to say that it's impossible to do this in like typed racket and then have like all of that work it's just that i haven't done it so yeah. okay now one of the things that you mentioned is, is that you know it's not performant for big inputs and that kind of thing like what is the reason for that is it that like R does some really cool uh, thing. You know what I mean? Like, is it like a deep reason? Is it a boring reason? Is it something that you care about fixing? Can you kind of, you know? It is, it is something that I care about fixing. Ultimately, I feel like, um, first off, um, again, like the R and Julia library is for similar tasks. I've had a lot of time to develop and I haven't. And that, and also I am ultimately a second year undergrad and I am not great at optimizing things. Uh, but I do think that it's something that could definitely be resolved. Um, I also feel like there are probably maybe more clever ways of storing the data internally or maybe more clever ways of not having as many intermediaries. Like especially when doing stuff with groups, there's a lot of copying that ends up going on in the background. So I'm hoping to maybe reduce that and do stuff in place, but yeah. Like there's nothing inherent to it that makes it unperformant. It's just that there is optimization that needs to be done and I am busy, but. So um, it would this be a valid way to characterize what you said, which is that you haven't really tried to optimize it. You know, you weren't trying to be dumb, but you haven't also said, okay, I'm gonna do this amazing cool optimization. And let's say for instance, if we look in R, like, I don't know, Maybe we know that the data is only loaded one time into one giant matrix. And then what really gets passed around are like slices that record 
you know, where to go look in the original data. And you're not doing any cleverness like that. You're just actually, you know, manipulating lists of stuff. And so you're kind of doing it in the most obvious way. And it's unsurprising mm -hmm. that that isn't performance. Yeah, I mean, that's part of it. Although, funny thing, you should mention the slice stuff with regards to, like, grouping, because that is actually something that I do. But uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, there's definitely just, I, I feel like most of it is just, there's too much copying going on. But, hmm. yeah. Now, uh, do you think that the, do you think that the, the type question is related to the performance at all? Or do you think that's just a, a red herring? I don't know. By the way, is that R, they're not typed right. Uh, yeah. They're, they seem like a big giant hack job. So I would not anticipate that uh, pervasive use of types is what, uh, is what is helping them. Yeah. And that and like the Julia library, which is occasionally more like convenient than, like, or not more convenient, not like more performance than the R library words. Um, that is quote unquote typed, but again, they're not really storing any tidiness information. They're not really storing any uh, like dimension information like in the types. Um, so, and they're still relatively performant. So I don't think that that's the approach that I would want to take, though it is definitely an interesting one. Well, cool. Well, thank you so much, uh, Hazel. Uh, I'm gonna clap for the whole audience now. Uh, you guys can all uh, you know, send clap icons. Uh, which people are doing. Wow. Um, I feel so appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, you, you gotta look at the YouTube log later and you'll see everyone clapping. All right, cool. All right. All right. So we're gonna switch now to Sid's talk. So um, I'm gonna turn off, you know, the, the mic and, uh, and video again, and uh, it'll just take you know, a moment to see that. Hey everyone, I'm Sid, and I'll be telling you about Qi, which is a functional, flow-oriented, general-purpose DSL. The Tao is constant in non-action, yet there is nothing it does not do. When things flow, everything feels effortless. But when things don't flow, it looks a little like this. This is a transformation of a single value but you wouldn't know it by looking at this expression because that value is nested deep inside it. This is a compound predicate formed from three independent predicates on the same um, subject, but you wouldn't know it because that information is not encoded in this expression. That is the fact that it is a com composite. This is a conditional expression whose entire concern is a single input value and you wouldn't know that again because that input value is mentioned no fewer than six times in this expression. Now, as developers, we don't like to repeat ourselves. So why is it that this kind of thing happens? And it's because there is a missing metaphor in the heart of our language, and that is the metaphor of flow. And what is flow? Well, Instead of telling you what flow is, we'll talk about what flows do. I think that's more useful. And we'll do that by looking at, we'll do it through this um, diagram that's called the flow diagram. And it depicts essentially everything of interest um, structurally about flows. So flows divide values, they redirect values, and they combine values. So in other words, flows are like this, rivers, streams, brooks flowing through rocks, um, taking whatever path they want. And that is what we seek to model in our language as well. So Qi is like, is a little bit like uh, closures threading macro, except that it's nonlinear and it accepts any number of input values and not just one. So while the threading macro is like a line, um, Qi is a, an acyclic graph or a DAG 
G is also like Unix pipelines, but it's more expressive and also for regular programming and not shell programming specifically. Um, so now when we look at the transformation that we saw earlier, it goes from looking like this to this, where you can see that it is a clear sequence of transformations. The predicates um, go from that to that. And this expression encodes that it is a compound predicate. So it has more information than the other version does. This conditional expression goes from mentioning the input value six times to men mentioning the input value not even once. And that is because it turns out that in essence, flows are point free. You never need to talk about the values that are flowing through the flow because whatever they are, they'll be transformed according to the structure and the nature of the flow. Okay, this all sounds great. How do I use it? Well, this is racket, this is scheme. So of course there's a, there's a language for that and it's the language we've been talking about, the Qi DSL. So why should you use it? Well, you should use Qi so that you don't have to repeat yourself and it often um, allows you to type less than you usually do. Expressions are shorter. It's sometimes faster, it's easier to read in many cases, and it allows you to uh, write fewer bugs. And in cases where there are bugs, um, it's easy to debug because flows decompose naturally. So you can just extract and insert components pretty easily. Where can you use it? Whenever you're working with functions. So you can use it pretty much always. Um, and so without further ado, let's learn the forms of the language. Um, the first one we'll look at is gen. This is, it stands for generate, and this allows you to turn any value, any racket value at all into a flow. So for functional programmers out there, this is the equivalent of pure for functors. If you think of um, flows as a functor. The point here is that you can, you, there's no barriers. You can make any racket values or any native values in whatever language you may be using. You can turn them into flows. Um, any native function is a flow. So if you're using racket, then um, all of your racket functions are flows. But they also support fine grained partial application. So you can partially apply these functions um, without using currying and things like that, using a intuitive and simple syntax. And then there's the ground form, which simply extinguishes any input values. Let's look at those. This is a vanilla shell. I'm gonna require racket, require chi. And this is the gen form, which simply generates three. So three is the output. And no matter what input values you pass to it, it's always going to just output three. Now, strictly speaking, you don't need this gen form here because she also treats literals as flows. So this is equivalent. But in general, you do need gen. For instance, if you're using identifiers, uh, it won't be treated as a flow automatically. This is the ground form. Any values that you pass in are extinguished. And this is not void, by the way. There are no output values here rather than void as an output value. Any function is a flow. So this squares the input value. 5 squared is 25. Um, this partially applies the plus function to 3. So you get 5 plus 3 here, which is 8. This specifies a template where we indicate the argument positions. And when you run this, the arguments get uh, placed in those positions and you get your output there. And you can also use a blanket template where if you don't want to indicate the positions individually, you can say put all of the arguments in this place by using two underscores, a double underscore that is, and that does that. Okay, so there's also routing forms. The threading form we briefly talked about, this just threads, it just composes flows in sequence, in series, 
Um, and it can, unlike the usual threading macro, it can thread any number of values and not just one. Let's look at that. Thread through square and add one. Three squared plus one is 10. Um, this threads two values through the string append function. And also note that in, so thus far we've been entering the Qi DSL using the yin yang symbol because that's the way you enter the language. It's the standard way you enter the language. But because the threading form is so common, we also provide a racket level macro, which allows you to enter the Qi language um, in the threading uh, mode. So that works like that. And notice also that we use the template in this threading form. Now that template is not specific to threading. It works with any flow. And it just so happens that we're composing it with the threading form in this case. Okay, um, relay, um, just like um, threading, the threading form composes flows in, se in series, relay composes um, flows in parallel. Fanout divides the input into n copies of itself or themselves, if there's more than one. The T-junction forks the flow. And we'll see that in action soon. And the AMP form is analogous to MAP for lists, except that it operates on values and passes all input values through a common flow. So let's look at the relay first. We're passing three and five in parallel through add one and square. So three plus one is four and five squared is 25. Now we're gonna fan out the input value to 10 copies of itself. This is what happens there. We can also fan it out and do a thousand copies of itself and then feed that into the, the addition flow using a threading form. And that gives us 5,000. Turns out that five added to itself a thousand times is 5,000, which of course you could do using multiplication, but that wouldn't be as fun. Um, and then this is the T-junction which divides the input flow. Um, so this becomes five squared, which is 25, and five plus one, which is six. T-junctions aren't constrained to just one input value, just like the rest of the, the flows. And you can pass in two input values, and this does three plus five and three minus five, and you get two outputs. Um, this is the AMP form. We, it's just like MAP, except that it's on values. So you, have, you pass in a bunch of input values and you get a bunch of output values, which are the squares of the input values. Okay. There's also conditionals. Typically in Racket, we use if and cond. Um, Qi introduces a new conditional form at the Racket level called switch, which is a point-free dispatcher with the predicate and consequent exceptions. Um, clauses are all flows. Let's look at it in action. So um, this is a function that you, some of you may recognize. It is the metacircular evaluator from the structure and interpretation of computer programs, which is a well-known computer science textbook. Now, this is the eval function, which is engaged in uh, evaluating an expression in the context of an environment. And it mentions that expression 25 times, I believe, in the body of this cond expression. Now we can alternatively think of it as a flow. We have an expression coming in and we wanna do something with it. And everything that we condition upon is gonna be based on that expression. So when you turn it into a flow, you just have to mention it once instead of 25 times. And all of the clauses become a lot more clear because you don't have to repeat the expression in each of them in both the predicate and the consequent expressions. Um, so that's just an example of how you could use switch in the wild. Oh, um, so ordinarily when we write programs, we are describing computations using text, symbols, words, letters, and so on. But with G, um, it's almost as if you're just depicting the computations rather than describing them. So um, it's like you're drawing what you want to occur. And so there are some aesthetic considerations that come into play. Um, 
And syntax and semantics are things we often talk about in programming language communities. But with Qi, we also want to think about semiotics for the reason I just alluded to. But here you have, okay, so I'm going to give you a series of examples of um, Qi forms on the left and the diagrams they depict on the right. And this will give us some intuition as to why the forms look the way they do and will help us remember them. This is the threading form. It's just an arrow. This is the T junction. The relay, the AMP form, because all of the input values get fed through a common flow. And this, these forms we haven't talked about yet. Uh, they are the separate and collect forms. Now, typically in Racket, we work with lists a lot, but in Qi, we work with values. So often you need to translate between the two, and that's what these forms do. If you want to understand what these forms do, let's look at the image on the right, and you see that it's a pair of prisms. And what happens is when you pass light through a prism, it gets separa separated into its component colors. And if you pass it into an upside down prism after that, these component colors get reconstituted back into white light again. And that's exactly what these uh, forms do in Qi. The upright prism separates a list into its component values. The upside down prism reconstitutes a list from values. So if you look at that entire expression on the left there, including the threading form, what do you think it does? Well, it does exactly what happens on the right. It's an identity transformation. List comes in and list goes out unchanged. You can also swap the prisms there and get an identity transformation on values instead of lists. There are also some higher order forms, including accumulators and loops. These are left and right folds. If you want to remember which one is the left fold, just look at the direction that it folds in. If it folds on the right, it's a right fold. Um, and these fold over values rather than lists. This is the loop form for structural recursion over values. And I just want to point out that when we do structural recursion over lists, um, the implementations of functions that do that kind of thing are shown on the left there. And you see that they have to deal with destructuring it and then reconstituting or constructing the data structure at the end. But the implementations for the values-based equivalents are almost trivial because they don't have to do that. So it's just kind of interesting that when you're dealing purely with values, a lot of this boilerplate disappears. Um, and there's also a number of other flows included, a, lot, a number of other forms in the language so that Qi is probably Turing complete, but you probably don't need all that power. Um, and all of this is possible. Qi is possible because of Racket's core values, so to speak. In that Racket has a symmetry between input arguments and return values for functions. So any function can accept any number of input values and produce any number of return values. And uh, this makes Qi possible. Uh, because if it weren't like that, it would be much harder to implement. But it also gives us something else. It just might give us the ability to implement something similar to closures transducers, which are a way to do uh, generic versions of all sequence operations and uh, in such a way that they don't build intermediate collections on the way to the result. Now, cheese flows transform pure values. There's no knowledge of collections in there. Um, so it's possible that they could provide the same kind of functionality. Well, I think a couple of things will be needed in order for this to happen. Um, first, multiple values should be accepted in traditionally single valued settings. For instance, if you look at that cons expression at the top there, it's a standard cons, uh, except that we're passing in two values to the first position in that expression, which is currently an error. But if you just say what it is, 
you're consing two values onto a list. That makes sense in English. So if the language also supported that intuitive behavior, um, it turns out that it allows this kind of thing, which is if you look at the second expression there, you can map a list under a flow, which you can already do, of course, except that this flow has, it changes the arity. So the number of input values is not the same as the number of output values, which again would be an error at the moment, but with the change that we are talking about here, this would work. And you would essentially be able to expand the list out from the inside, uh, which if you try to think about how you would do that without flows, where it's so intuitive and obvious how to do it with flows, but without flows, it turns out that there isn't really a clean implementation, or at least I wasn't able to come up with one. Um, and the second thing that would be needed is if you receive no values in traditionally single valued settings. So again, if you look at the cons expression there, you're saying cons no values onto a list. Now again, in English, it makes sense what should happen, but it's an error at the moment in bracket. But if it were supported, um, then it would allow this expression at the bottom, which uh, maps an input list under a flow, which only allows the odd values through. So the ARD reduces and you can filter a list using map. Now, when you put these things together, you can, fill, you can again map a list under a flow except that you put the, the two flows that we just saw in sequence. So you first filter and then you uh, split the inputs and you can, and that's the output there. And you do these, the series of transformations without building the intermediate lists um, because you're only building the collections at the end and you're destructuring the collection at the beginning possibly. Um, so I looked at schemes um, the scheme specification, and it turns out that what should happen, the behavior in these, these cases that we've been talking about is unspecified. So this seems like it might leave the door open for us to define some new conventions here, if any of this uh, makes sense. Um, and of course, uh, the other aspect of transducers is genericity, genericity of map, filter, and sequence operations. That doesn't require core changes. That's already there in collection lib, for instance. And that would just work with some of the changes we're talking about here. Uh, some related work is Rash, everybody's favorite shell, um, which is an interface between Racket and the Unix shell. Um, and since Unix has always had a flow metaphor in shell pipeline, um, whereas Racket has not, now that Racket does have one, I think it could enhance the Rash experience. Um, threading macros we already talked about. Now Fluent is another package we saw recently, which is similar to threading macros, except that it uses infix notation. Um, so it would be kind of interesting to see if infix notation would be something we could have with chi as well. Um, I do think it would pre present some new challenges though, because with the non-linearity, it might not be so easy to use infix notation, but if it's possible, that would be worth looking into. Um, some future work would be making chi macro extensible. This would be wonderful because it would allow anybody to extend the forms of the language without needing to submit a pull request, and it might enable domain-specific dialects. Core-level transducers we just talked about. And then another interesting thing is global or monadic side effects. We already have local side effects in the language, meaning that you can attach a side effect to any particular flow, and it would happen without affecting the behavior of that flow. But what would be nice is if we can have a global side effect on the flow such that every component of the flow inherits it. And just by saying something in one place, like display line, for instance, as a side effect, every component of your flow would output its values um, at the, by printing them without modifying the behavior of the flows themselves. And I think this would be pretty powerful and useful. <clears throat> 
Um, other things to explore could be hash langs with other semantics for function application because she inherits the semantics of function application from the underlying language, uh, which is typically racket, of course, but we could potentially write other languages which may interface with AWS Lambda or something like that. It might be interesting to use Qi just the way we we're using it already, except that it would work with AWS Lambda or something like that. Um, Graphical representations could be interesting. It could also be fun to write a meta circular chi evaluator in chi um, just to see if the language is true and com complete. And if it isn't, then understand what is missing. Um, and this is a fun exercise. Um, I'd like to acknowledge Greg. Uh, his fear of macros is how I learned about racket macros. And Jay has. Um, this resource called Advanced Racket Macros, which has a section about presenting the right level of abstraction in your linguistic primitives, like your language, basically, so that you don't expose the implementation details. And I've tried to do that. I think there are still some leaks. So if you see an error message that doesn't make any sense, uh, please create an issue or a pull request. Sam's fancy app powers the uh, most of the template behavior in G, and it's great that I could just delegate this to fancy app and just have it do it very well um, without having to do that stuff in Qi. Um, Matthew Butterick's beautiful racket um, is how I learned about hygiene. And uh, it turns out that actually hygiene um, isn't really needed. You don't need to think about it so much in the context of Qi because there's no identifiers. And when you don't have identifiers, there's no problem, as it turns out. And uh, I've also asked questions on IRC and gotten useful answers. Uh, so that's been great. That's it. Um, any questions? Very good, Tim. Thank you. Uh, have to say that turn on. Hey, uh, hey, Sid, can you see me okay? Hi, yeah, I can see you. Okay, good. Um, well, those are fun talks, and um, we got some cool questions, so let's jump right into them. So, um, one of the first questions um, is uh, about the the Chi macro itself. Um, does it like, does it return a value? Okay, let me, let me step back one second. I have created a flow. I want to use that flow in another position. Do I give the name inside of the Chi macro or do I give the name outside of the Chi macro or does it not matter? Or is this heresy because I shouldn't be talking about make, giving things and names in the first place? Well, it's actually simpler than that, I think. You, you, they're just, they compile down just to functions. So you can use them anywhere that you can use functions. So you can define a, a flow and then put it outside a flow or inside a flow. Um, anything would work. OK. Um, the next thing is, uh, in your in your SICP example, uh, you got rid of the expression, but you didn't get rid of environment. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, you said, oh, you know, expression is here 25 times. Well, it, it, I was looking and environment is there like 10 or 15 times. It's, it's used a lot. So huh. um, yeah. I have a challenge for you, which is, is that like, what is the flow feature that makes it so I can like take in two things and like move them around in the, in the most beautiful way? Um, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I mean, actually, I, I it didn't even occur to me to, to remove um, environment, I think, because I, I was... I did that at an early stage of development where I wasn't uh, doing it with multiple valleys and things like that. But, but yeah, uh, that could be interesting to try. Um, so yeah, maybe, maybe somebody should try it or I'll try it. <laughs> see what happens. But you can do that in principle because it accepts any number of values. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another kind of little thing that, you know, so uh, reveal, like I've watched this talk, I don't know, like, four or five times now because, uh, you know, we're getting things ready for the for the conference. And it has taken me this many times to like finally have the prisms click for me. Um, and now when I look at it, 
like just watching it this last time I finally got it and I really and I feel like I'm a complete idiot for not getting it before but like at first I was like what is with this like Pink Floyd thing we just got going on <laughs> now I'm like this is brilliant yes because the list comes in and you split it up into all its constituent pieces and then you can combine it back together again now the thing the, the question that I have about that though is like how does that relate to when there's different numbers of things uh coming out like um yeah can, can you like wrap on how prison is like useful in practice for the things that you've done well um oh hi there um it's useful in general just uh to translate between the two worlds of lists and values um, so whenever you need to do that, you know, um, you might be tempted to, to put a list flow in there to convert something into a list and then put an apply or something like that. This just saves you the trouble where you may not have to do that. Um, if there's a function that accepts multiple values, you don't need to apply it with, you know, by converting the arguments into a list. And if there's a function that accepts a list, then you could just like convert your values into a list unless they already are a list. Um, so it's just sort of the translation between the two made more seamless. Maybe, maybe I'm asking a slightly different question, which is, is that um, the kind the situation where I have like a list of three things and I want to turn that into three values, modify those, and then come back to a list of three things again, that's sort of like lame lists. You know what I mean? That's like, that's like lists when I don't know that I really want to define a data structure. Um, it's like using lists as tuples. Uh, is there a, does it make sense to generalize prism to like arbitrary data structures? Like, you know, the classic posin. Can I have a, can I have a posin prism, prism that consumes a posin, turns it into two things, and then another one that takes two things and turns it into a posin. And I want those prisms to like, I want there to be one of them for every kind of data structure. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, no, that sounds really useful. I did think about it in the context of uh, sequence types that aren't lists, like vectors and so on. So currently it, it uses lists specifically. Um, so yeah, I mean, that is something that would be a goal and that would be great if we could do that for arbitrary data structures. Um, I'm not sure what that would entail. I don't know if we could inherit that from the from the base hash lang. Um, if, for instance, you have um, a function that already does that, at least for sequences, you could have a generic version of, um, you know, converting from an input sequence type to a vector, and then or a list or whatever, and then maybe that would just work if you inherited it from the language. But, uh, but I'm not sure, actually. It would be interesting. It certainly would be a desirable goal. Let me just say yeah. that. OK, now, uh, you know, in the very beginning, uh, you've been talking about, well, not in the beginning of the talk, but in the beginning of me talking to you, you talked about this idea of having values, like, you know, splat in and function calls. And, you know, I told you that this was heresy. And then you went and found in the spec, I love, this is brilliant, but actually it's allowed, right? Because the spec does not say what it means. So this is extremely clever, Sid. And uh, I want to, you know, extremely praise you uh, on this about, you know, saying, well, this is a, a valid scheme implementation could do this. The thing though, is, is that, you know, values in the first position of cons just like happens to work in the way that you describe. But what if I want values in the second position of cons? So what I mean by that is I have cons one, values, list two, and list three. Right. What, what is this supposed to do? Um, maybe run the function as if those were passed in sequence. Um, so it would run it twice. Cons one onto list five, and then uh, cons one onto list seven, and then return to values as output. Hmm. So it's almost like um, uh, since two values came in the second position, that means that we want two values to come out. We want to cons this one thing onto each of the things that came in there. Uh, yeah, that's one way. That that's one way of thinking about it. It's um, AMB. It's AMB. Oh, my gosh. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I've seen AMB before, but I don't remember it. But OK, cool. Yeah, so you're saying that we're going we're gonna to pick the one that works out later on. Um, yeah, I think that, uh, <laughs> I, I think that, uh, I think that this idea of, uh, of 
what what Valerie should do in that situation um, is weird and cool. Uh, now, you know, suppose for instance that you did, this question would be different, I think, if you didn't say cons, but instead you said list star. Because list star already takes many, many arguments and whatever the last one is, that's the thing that's the tail of the list. So if you were to tell me, oh, I want, I want list star to like also work on values, then to me, this sounds like, um, you know, in like JavaScript, there's the spread operator, which is kind of like apply, um, where you're just saying that when a values is there, it just is implicitly like an apply. We just plop those all in and they like take up, you know, whatever arguments in that spot. Basically what I'm saying is that I think you should really explore this idea about what would happen if we had multiple, uh, you know, arguments coming in and, 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 and what, that, what that really means. So I want you to explore this more. Cool. I mean, yeah, I'm glad it isn't completely shut down. I know you said it was heresy, but you also encouraged me to. Like it, so. <laughs> now, now, my final question, um, which is when I look at some of the some of the the flow diagrams, I agree that they're beautiful and clear. When I look at other ones, I'm like, let me translate this to use variables, and then I can understand what it is. Am I like a peon who doesn't have your brain and like, or do you do this too? Like you have to be honest with me. Like, do you, do you write it down the version with, with variables and then you go back and say, I'm gonna flowify this? Or are you really seeing the flow in your brain? And then you're like, oh, I'm just gonna translate this into sheet. Like, and, and here's, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of joking, but I'm also saying that like constantly when we're talking about like racket or functional programming in general, um, people that are not used to that will say, how could you possibly program that way? I mean, like, I need a for loop, man. I need, I need to have, you know, this mutation. And we're just like, oh, just trust me. Just program long enough. Like, you'll get it. Um, I, are you like a higher dimensional being than me? And you've gone through this flow transformation that I haven't? <laughs> well, um, well, the flow transformation is just familiarity, I think. Uh, the longer you spend doing it this way, uh, the less you need to do that. Yeah, initially, you know, when I first made it and everything, I didn't have any practice using it, but I made some of it. And I was like, oh, this is cool. And then I'm like, oh, how do I translate this, blah, blah, blah. But then over time, it just gets easier. And then, you know, just like learning anything, um, the more you do it, the more familiar it becomes. And then it, it, also, um, it also pays off. See, the thing is, it, even if it is more challenging to learn initially, eventually, I think you develop a level of fluency that's comparable. Um, but it also pays off in what it gets you because now it's debuggable. You know, if something goes wrong, you just like pluck something out and put a different thing there and attach a side effect, a display line. So your, your debugging can be a little more structured uh, or a lot more structured. Um, and it just takes effort to, to learn, I think, but could be worth it. I think it's worth it. Cool. All right, well, I buy it. All right, well, thank you so much, Sid and Hazel. Uh, we're gonna go back to the gather town now. Uh, so um, Hazel will be in the upper left-hand corner, which is discussion area A, and Sid will be in the upper right-hand corner, which is um, discussion area B. And we will reconvene in about, I guess, 50 minutes. So, you know, 2.30 uh, best time. And um, uh, that'll be for the next two talks. And so uh, we'll see you all again in a little while. The, the live stream will be turned off again, and we'll just be in the gather town. <laughs>